girlfriend's been a little bit concerned of the number of syringes that I've been buying lately. I assure you, it's not a, a, a it's not a drug thing. I promise. It's uh, it's just that these glass syringes are so neat. There's no rubber. There's no like positive seal. But yet somehow you could do things like this. So basically, really good seal, really small amount of friction. So. It, you can feel friction when you pull it in and out, but also a lot of that is because the opening is just like a sixteenth of an inch. But here's the crazy part. So for whatever reason, when you spin it like this, the friction goes to little to nothing. So this is what was on my mind when I was watching a Tom Staten video where he was building an engine that's supposed to run on air. And I thought, I got an idea. What if I got one of these glass syringes and did the same thing that Tom Staten did? Build an engine. All right, everyone. Welcome back to Geared On For What. I'll be your host, Ross, back from a four-year hiatus to come and try to build an engine more powerful than Tom Statton's. Will that succeed? You won't find out until you watch till the end of the video. <laughs> so we're going to be cutting some glass to fit our engine that we're going to build. So this is going to be, of course, the, the, the outside of the cylinder. And then this other part that we're going to cut is the piston. So you see that there. This actually was not my first attempt in cutting these syringes. Um, this is a lot harder than you would think because at first I bought one of those glass scribing tools and 3D printed a thing to help me spin it around the cylinder much like a copper pipe cutter and it just didn't work. Uh, so you could score it and I tried running it under hot water or blasting it with a torch and cooling it in one spot. It just wouldn't cut it. It would, well, it would cut it, but then it would also crack it or break it. And I found this diamond cutting tool works really good for this. All right, guys, here it is. Here's the engine all assembled together. Let's see if we can make it run. And it doesn't run. Uh, so the problem here, I think, is the pin is too long. So I, I've actually went back and forth a few times, pin too short, pin too long, and I can't make it run either way. I don't know how Tom Statton's version works so well, but I'm this one doesn't work very well. Uh, it's like there's too much variability in how far up the piston goes. I'm not sure if that's because I don't actually have a wrist pin and the piston is floating. Neither does Tom Staten. I don't know why mine doesn't work, but uh, it doesn't work. Interestingly though, I found out that if I just hold like a stack of five magnets in this one very specific spot, it does work. It doesn't really make much sense to me why that makes it work, but it makes it work. I'm guessing it just holds the ball valve open for longer, and so it pushes the piston the correct way for longer than it pushes it the wrong way, and then it works. I don't like this solution, though. The strangest thing has happened. Um, I was messing around with this, trying to get it working, uh, by just tapping a battery on these leads, not really expecting anything. It works. I mean, it there's an electromagnet in here and, you know, some stuff. But why does that work? Why? <laughs> it works just fine. It's not reversing direction. It's really stable. It's got, you know, not a lot of torque running at, like, almost no PSI. But it works. And it starts going, like, stupid fast. I think the limiting factor at this moment is when I turn the pressure up so high, the the valve here gets harder and harder to push open, and <laughs> my push rod keeps getting shorter and shorter by, you know, thousands of a millimeter each cycle because it's wearing down. So then the piston isn't pushing up on the bearing as hard, so then it, doesn't, it can't get the bearing open far enough to get enough air to, to push it back down. Notice that it doesn't come all the way to the top of the cylinder, and it used to, so that's how much the connecting rod has wore down. Uh, what do you call that concave surface if it was a spherical end on the connecting rod i wouldn't have had this problem i should probably reprint that part so i don't have to do this anymore but uh let's just make a little adjustment here so it's a it's an m3 threaded bolt inside here that i've just shaved the the point the head down to a point and so i'll just thread that out like half a turn ish and then put it back in and uh hook it back up And the cylinder's made of glass, and I don't want to have to cut another one. So the, the crankshaft comes in two pieces. And here's the connecting rod. 
And as you could see, it's had a rough life. So the connecting rod was two-dimensional, so that was part of the problem. And it's going into a hole that is like inside of a sphere, it's, a, it's concave. But it started to melt, actually. So this plastic that you see around the outside of it is uh, not supposed to be there. It is definitely melted, and that is why the engine's uh, pin pusher thing keeps getting shorter and shorter is because the, the connecting rod is melting away. The engines are not running very well, they're just running really, really fast. Right before it ran out of air. I better plug it back in just to see what it is. Not good. Not good. So I built the diaphragm valve here. This little tiny hole right here is the bleed hole. So when this is covered, the valve should be sealed. And when this is open, the valve should pop open. So there's a little spring return. So it is sprung in this direction, so it should seal it. Let's give it a try. So it kind of functions. This is the issue that I've been struggling with this valve is trying to get the thing to seal around here. So I did try covering this sealing area in super glue. I tried covering it or I tried scraping it so that it was like a clean surface to seal against this O-ring. I just couldn't get this version to seal. I, I can't make this version work. So I actually, I made another one. So I decided to replace a plastic plunger with a screw and the, the screw actually seats on an O-ring now. So as long as the O-ring is seated against the plastic without leaking, it shouldn't leak past. You could probably hear that hitting the microphone. So now it does actually seal and it shoots a large amount of air out of the exit. So now what we need is a sewing needle that fits perfectly in this hole is our flow control. Okay, I found one. Let's try it out now. It's surprising how little air comes out of here because what we did, instead of drilling a hole through the diaphragm and allowing air to bypass through the diaphragm, the rubber I got, it, it doesn't drill nicely. So I couldn't drill a small hole, it would just rip. Uh, so I instead opted to not put a hole in the diaphragm and put um, a three millimeter bolt in here. And this hole is tapered, so it's bigger at the top, smaller at the bottom. The more you tighten this bolt, the less air can get to the back side of the diaphragm, which allows, <laughs> Uh, very little air to the back side of the diaphragm so it can empty quickly and it, it does affect the fill time which I'm concerned about but you can adjust it by threading this bolt in or out the one in that hole and this was um, not actually the first iteration of this valve design there was a few others like this one and this one Okay, so off camera here, what I've done is I've attached that pin to that stack of magnets that you see moving, and uh, it works. It, it does work. It has an RPM issue. You can't get going very fast, and there's also a software issue to where it will just randomly backfire because the guy that I hired to write the software just didn't know what he was doing. So um, that was actually chat GPT, uh, and that didn't it worked a little bit, but it's just not reliable. It took me a while to finally find that software issue, but I did find it. It was decently hard to find for how glaringly obvious it should have been, uh, but ChatGPT seems to make errors like that. But also, the valve isn't reliable, but because the pin sometimes gets stuck into that tiny hole too hard, I feel like someone's going to turn that into something, and then the valve doesn't open the next time, and it gets jammed, and you've got to pull the magnets out by hand. So... I spent a lot of time on this. Like, this was weeks of work designing this valve. And now I'm realizing that it probably was a waste of time. I looked online and I found an air valve. Now, I don't honestly think that this is going to work. Because, like, look at the size of that port there. It's like a, a millimeter. And that one's pretty small and that one's pretty small. I don't think this is going to work. But we're going to try it. Maybe this works. I know for one thing, it's gonna be more reliable. I was messing around with it a little bit on the air compressor. So what we got here, I think it's called a two-way air valve. So this would be the inlet. This is the normally open outlet. 
and then this is the normally closed outlet. When you power it, the two outlets switch. Um, but I did mess with it just a little bit, and I figured out that actually it can handle the most air pressure when you use this as the inlet, and then this as the outlet. Uh, so this would be the, from the air compressor, and then this would go into the piston, or into the, the cylinder. And actually, you can make it so that when it's powered one way, um, it puts air into the engine, and when it's powered the other way, it puts air out of the engine. So to increase performance a little bit, I decided to take this valve apart, just drill it out as much as I could. So uh, this part comes right off, just drill that as deep as I can. Here I actually ripped the seat on this one. And so it's a little bit hard to drill this part of it without ripping that seat. Once you rip that, you, you can't use this part anymore. So this one's actually junk. I just drilled out all of these ports until um, it didn't work. And then we <laughs> went back to the last size because I bought a whole bunch of these little valves. <laughs> so naturally, the thing that I thought would never work, works really, really well. For the purposes of showing up Tom's den, I decided that it would be, you know, in my best to uh, build an engine thrust test stand like Tom has. So this has a weight so here with a little gear jerry rigged on there because otherwise this lever arm bends too far and pushes on the wrong side of the load cell. I calibrated it with a, I think it was a hundred gram weight. I had to lay it on its side to do that, but I'm pretty sure it's accurate. And yeah, so I mount the engine on top of this rod as the plan and then hook up to this Arduino board and get the data through the serial monitor. And we're hoping that works. We started off with this little propeller and I decided that the RPMs, this thing is gonna have to chew chatter, is gonna be, have to be pretty quick. So that's when I decided I should probably get this big propeller. Now, little did I know is that Tom Staten's actually using a 15 inch propeller and this one's a 14. I kind of wish this one was bigger. We might end up 3D printing one if I can get it to be efficient enough. It's a gear ratio of 1.6 to one. Um, so let's see how many ripples we can get. We are in the kitchen. We have a one gallon air compressor. We have DC power supply that powers a solenoid valve and Arduino reading the serial monitor over here. There we go. Now we're showing our thrust is about 45. That's grams. So we're trying to get the pressure as high as we can get it. a little bit scary. So we broke the crankshaft that time. Having a great time, I uh, 3D printed my own propeller and accidentally super glued it to my finger. All right, let's go.
It's still going to torque you, not this small RPM. So for this project, where I'm at is I uh, haven't achieved the level of thrust that Tom Staten has, not even close to what he was at. Now, I don't know, I could maybe put this on an airplane and make it fly, but if Tom Staten's struggling to make it work and he has more thrust than I have, it's not going to work, right? It could work, but it's probably not going to work. So it's in my best interest at this point to spend more time and revise the engine more and more to try to get more thrust out of it so that it could possibly work down the road. But for now, it's not working and that's okay. I'll keep revising, I'll keep finding new things to try to make it both more powerful and hopefully more efficient. And then I could maybe bother to build an airplane. But until then, it's not gonna be worth my time. So until next time, I guess, goodbye.